Grace, thank you very much. I'm sorry we're a little late, but the uh, flight schedule from London to uh, Ljubljana isn't the most convenient, um, but it was direct and nearly made it on time. Uh, and I know it's a little late for a lecture, but I think it is a, a really exciting event that has been organised by the comrades, not only tonight with the lecture, but what's going to happen over the next couple of days and last week. It's a, I'm really excited to be able to participate in this because I see this as one of the most uh, important things that's been done uh, since uh, the recession to organise both uh, to understand what the, uh, the Great Recession and the austerity that followed and the policies of neoliberalism applied by the European governments, to understand what that means and how to organise against it and to take it further, not just to discuss it in lectures like this, but actually to organise uh, to try and reverse that on behalf of the people who have suffered. And remember, uh, I was thinking when I was reading the preparing the material for these next couple of days, that apart from the Greek working class, which has suffered a 30% fall in living standards, the Slovenian working class is the next, a 13 to 15% on average fall in living standards. So it's the most, uh, it's second in line to the Greeks in terms of the uh, victims out of this uh, crisis over the last five years. And this lecture has really got a very simple proposition. We call it the socialization of banking. But I'm presenting a very simple idea to you the banking should not be aimed at providing at a money-making machine to speculate for profits uh, and for grotesque salaries and bonuses on the part of the uh, owners, uh, owners and the managers of the banks. The banking should be a public service for the people. We live in a monetary modern economy. Money is not going to disappear in my lifetime. We have to consider the question. It's a very important part of the economy where most of the resources, investment and savings flow through the banking system and then back into uh, households and into companies. People put their money in banks, uh, whether they're running small businesses or whether they're depositing their wages every week or every month. And banks have that deposit supply and other methods. They are a key part of the whole circulation of capital in a modern monetary economy. So it seems to me a simple proposition that really they should work for the people. They are not designed to work against the people, or should not be designed to work against the people. The aim to achieve a banking system which is for the people, a public service, just like education, just like health, just like transport should be, should be can only really be achieved if the public own and control that banking system. And it's not just a question of public ownership, as I hope to show, but also a question of a democratically accountable operation and system for banking, which works within the national, for that matter, an international plan to meet the social needs of the people and not a profit of the few. So what is to stop us turning banking, whether it's in Slovenia or in any of the big uh, capitalist economies, into a public service that will help the people? Well, in my view, nothing is to stop us doing that in, is the short answer. And in order to look at how we can do that, we have to go back to where banking is now, and what it is, uh, what it is uh, represented during this crisis. We, every person knows that the crisis began with a banking crash. We're told it's a banking collapse, and that what flowed from that was the need to sort out the banks, and it was the state and the taxpayer and workers in general that have had to, to pay for this. It's a global banking crash. And it not only uh, achieved the, the, the task of bringing about this crisis, but it also cost us a huge amount of money because the decision was made that banks should be bailed out. They shouldn't be taken over, reorganized, and put in, uh, in, a, in the place where they should be organized for the people. That the existing banking system, with all the, the capitalist ownership, the cross hut shareholdings, the equity ownership by uh, various companies and other banks, the huge financial sector should be bailed out, should be funded if necessary. Should, some, some banks were allowed to go to the wall, and there's still some discussion in America about the, the bank that went to the wall, uh, Lehman's, whether that was a good idea, but most banks were bailed out. In the case of Ireland, not only were they bailed out in huge amounts of money from the, from the state, but every single bondholder in the, uh, Ireland People who were getting their interest by buying bank bonds got all their money back and continued to do so. 
at, at the expense of the taxpayer, despite the fact that if you start to invest in a bank and it's a risk-taking venture, why don't you take the hit when the risk goes wrong? Apparently not, because banking is so important, we cannot allow it to collapse. We cannot allow it to cause a meltdown in the capitalist system. And this is the IMS figure. They looked at, uh, a couple of years ago, how much it cost us to uh, bail out the banks. If you take the end one there, you see that it, the bailout for the island was 40% of GDP. You can come right down the list and you can see in the case of Greece, it's nearly 20% of Greek's GDP right down. The average is about 7% for the, for, for, for the world. How much of that's been recovered in selling off bank assets, in uh, selling, uh, uh, selling back shares that have been taken over, and, and returning monies that were being lent to the banks? Well, on average, just under, about only just about 50% is the average, and in many countries, less than 25% of the money has come back to the taxpayer. Look at Ireland. Ireland, 40% laid out in bailout, has so far got back uh, around about 4%, so it's got 10% back of what, it, uh, what the taxpayer gave to bail out the banks. On that, on that basis, after five years, it's going to take probably between 50 and 60 years for the taxpayers to get their money back if they ever do, which of course they won't, because what has happened is a lot of that will be written off and people will just pay uh, money in extra taxes or in cuts in uh, government spending to cover those uh, losses. And overall, if you include the um, bank guarantees and other measures that were bailed out, put, handed out to the banks over the past few years, something like three trillion dollars has been given to bail out the banks. And as I say, less than uh, half of that has come back to the taxpayer. So there's been a, a loss that can never be replaced in order to restore a banking system as it was. Because that's what the, the purpose was, not to restructure it, not to change its purpose, not to uh, change it the way it operates and what it's aimed at doing, but just to continue as it was before. <coughs> and the hit that the banking system took in meltdown and the impact that it's had on the wider economy, you know, also know. Because out of that, in order to pay for the bank bailout, people have had to have to see the taxes rise, the government spending go, then we, the, a lot of companies went to the wall, we had a massive uh, recession, huge increase in unemployment, loss of wages, output disappeared. Now, here is an estimate again, this time from the Bank of England, which says, well, let's look at a crime with ordinary recessions. Or, capitalism has regular recessions, they call them ordinary ones, average ones. We can see the red line says that on average, after about four quarters, after a slump, <coughs> A capitalist economy is restored to where it was before, so it takes about a year. So there's a year's loss, but then it's back to the same level before, and then presumably it continues up. That's the red line. Now, we can see that in this particular, when you have a banking crash as well, so it's a combination of a collapse in the banking system and the recession, which is the green line there. I think I have a colour line there, that's right, green. Uh, you can see that it takes a lot longer. To reach the point where it's back to the same level before is more like 12 quarters or three years. It takes three years on average if you have a banking crisis and a recession. And in the case of the purple line there, that shows that the US has more or less taken three years to get its output back to where it was before after the uh, banking collapse and the recession. In the case of the Euro area and the UK, not only has it not got back to the same level, 20 quarters later, five years later, this is, it's, there's no sign that it's ever going to get back to this level. You can see at the moment it's stuck down there. So that means that if things are carried on in a straight line uh, without the crisis, and then you can see the gap, the loss that's taken place, so it's been estimated that something like, for some of these countries, five years of national output, five years of national output is lost forever. We can't get it back because we'll never catch up. So that this is a huge waste of resources and loss uh, for the people. And of course that's reflected in our living standards, in the conditions under which we work, and, and also the state of the infrastructure and everything else. So as I say, should it have been a bailout or should it have been a taker? What would have been best? Well, of course, the banks tell us that it would have been best to do what was happened, because otherwise there would have been a meltdown. But when I look at the evidence 
for suggesting that whether a bailout or a takeover by the government and the people to reorganise the banks would have been better. I realise that what's happened since, in these five years, since uh, the bailout has taken place, apart from the loss that's taken place, well, we now know the absolute incredible scandal that the banks, the private owners of these banks, have continued to do in the last five years after the meltdown, and of course before, the risk taking they took, all those uh, financial weapons of mass destruction, which is all those derivatives and special instruments of buying and selling with each other, and then uh, lending to people who can't afford to pay it back, subprime lending in the housing market, all those uh, methods by which they try to get more and more profit and hope that the whole house of cards will stay up. That's one thing. I mean, we know the scandals involved in that, but also we now know a lot more about what they've been doing in terms of rigging the interest rates, in terms of laundering people's uh, money, hiding it in special accounts. I'll come to some of the, the scandals if I can. And also continuing, after this crisis has taken place, to engage in risk-taking and betting on the market, losing billions. Um, as uh, the editor of the Rolling <coughs> Stone, the American uh, sort of left hippie paper said, uh, what have we got? We've got dying, uh, the, we're supposed to call banks that are really dead healthy. We're supposed to look at stress tests to see that banks are okay, they're sham. Uh, there's been no failure to enforce any changes in the bonuses. The banks are still getting, our state banks have just announced their bonuses up massively. Uh, only yesterday and this week, I mean, Wall Street has just said, it's great news, we've got our bonuses back up. That was just announced also this week. No change there. Seeming indifference to telling us what's going on. The public needs to know what's the state of the bank's books. We don't care. Not to mention all these criminal investigations that come about through the fraud. Now remember, not one single person apart from, uh, what's his name? Uh, in America who was found to be openly frauding other rich people has been uh, taken to task and brought to prison uh, as a result of the actions uh, carried out by the banks. Um, it's just, not, nothing has changed, it's business as usual. Um, so we have a banking system now which discriminates against little banks. Our co-op bank in the UK has just been decimated by this mess. Uh, it, Thus, it's still, we still have banks which are huge. In fact, the banks are even huger now because the ones that have gone down are concentrated in much larger numbers. So JP Morgan, which was a big bank before, now has an even bigger monopoly. In the case of the UK, we, we used to have uh, lots of banks. Some of them have gone. And we have two partially owned state banks which have the size and proportion of, of uh, the assets now. And nothing is done about improving business lending. There's no... If you put your money in the banks, you hardly get any interest. You can't get a loan from them. If you do, it's at an exorbitant rate. Uh, that's for small businesses. And so, and they continue to, con with all the activities that they engaged in before. I mean, we have the example of, oh no, the LIBOR scandal, where the banks engaged in rigging the interest rate, which sex all the borrowing for mortgages and other things across Europe and across uh, the world. Uh, the UK banks were behind that, Barclays. Perhaps the biggest scandal was the other UK bank, HSBC, um, which is a global bank for the, for the small person, as their advertising slogan. Well, they certainly helped out the Mexican drug cartels because they laundered billions, hundreds of millions of dollars of, a Mex of Mexican drug cartel money, hid it from the US authorities that they laundered this money, and were eventually found out and have made a p payment of a billion dollars back. So throughout the whole process, not only are we being ripped off by the banks, but they're actually engaged in criminal activities. In, in, another company, in the UK, we've had an example where the banks used to sell us personal injury insurance, so that, which most people didn't need, but every time they took a loan, they were offered a personal injury insurance and ended up having to pay a, a monthly premium to cover themselves for personal injury. Completely pointless. This has been now regarded as just absolutely uh, misrepresenting what people need, and they've had to pay that back. Lloyds Bank, which is our biggest bank, has now had to pay five billion dollars, five billion pounds back uh, as compensation to the people who, who took out these uh, insurances. And there's a series of others. And of course, we have the Royal Bank of Scotland, which engaged in not only bought big banks that it couldn't afford to do, it had huge pensions and bonuses for its chief executive. When he was sacked, it was found that not only was he earning millions, 
but he was going to get a pension for the rest of his life of one million pounds a year, and there was nothing that anybody, the government, would do about it, although it was now a state-owned bank. They were still going to pay him because it was in his contract, even though he had brought the bank down to his knees. And J.P. Morgan, which is now, in many ways, the biggest bank in the U.S., has, in the last uh, period since the Great Recession, has continued with its extensive range of derivatives betting. And it came to proper recently in London, in the, what is called the London Whale. They had a small unit there where they were engaged in all kinds of derivative uh, betting, and it went wrong, and they lost $5 billion worth of uh, J.P. Morgan and client money as a result of betting. Well, we were told that this is all supposed to be over. And in fact, the main trader said he warned uh, J.P. Morgan and executives that it was a, a difficult and scary situation. They ignored it. The U.S. supervisors of the bank, which is the controller of currency in the U.S., supervisors of all banks, did absolutely nothing while this process took place and the money went down the drain. As um, a very old right-wing free market economist said, Frédéric Bastiat, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men living together in society, usually men, they create for themselves in the course of the time a legal system that authorises it and a moral code that glorifies it. And that is what banking culture is. Um, Bob Diamond, who was the head of Barclays in the UK, involved in the LIBOR scandal, eventually sacked, but only because the governor of the Bank of England said, you've got to go. Even his own board was going to keep him in position, even though it had been exposed that he was op he'd operated this process uh, of uh, rigging the interest rates. He made a statement recently, because he's now got a religion, he said, for me, the evidence of culture is how people behave when no one is looking. Well, we know how he behaved when no one was looking. And so do most of the other banking executives involved. Nevertheless, it doesn't seem to, to worry them too much. As we know, the head of Goldman Sachs is also another man who thinks he's doing God's work for banking. Uh, and most bankers have really been upset about the way they've been criticised over the last three years by various commissions. Uh, the head of uh, J.P. Morgan Investment Banking said uh, that about this time last year, banker bashing is a bad thing. If you wake up every morning to be lambasted in the headlines, it's less likely you'll want to work anymore, and that reaction will hurt the economy, <laughs> won't it? The UK must stop attacking the industry if it wants to remain a good place for global finance. So the attitude is no mea culpa, no humbleness about what's going on. This is the way it is, and this is the way it's going to continue as far as these uh, executives and the leaders are concerned. Now, I'm not saying that bankers are to blame in the sense that most bankers are ordinary bank workers in the branches, in the back offices, in the computer systems, in the earning not great bonuses, but pretty maybe regular work, or at least not these days because banking has been sharply cut back in the number of staff. These workers are not to blame for what's happened. These are the workers that could turn a banking system into a system for the public, for a, the, a public service. In the UK, we have 400,000, we had 400,000 people in the banking. As the Bank of England representative for financial stability, Andy Haldane, who's going to appear a few times here because he spoke to the Occupy group in the US, he said, well, 99% of people aren't really driven by individual greed or were negligent in the banking system. They didn't trouser skyscraper salaries. This is coming from the banking of the official. Uh, they are to blame. It was all the things that were wrong with the lack of the control over the banks and uh, what's going on at the top, the culture of finance at the top. And I think he's right. So we have to be careful. When we blame the banks for what's happened, we're not blaming the average ordinary bank worker is trying to do a job. In fact, those are the ones who have lost their jobs as a result. The top executives continue like musical chairs to go around. Now, what to do? Well, over the last five years, there's been an awful lot of discussion by banking commissions, by governments, by so-called experts of what to do, and economists. And basically, the three things that come up about what to do about the banking system to make it better so it doesn't do what it's done in the past, and you notice that one is very one possible solution is completely missing, which is public ownership under democratic accountability and control. That doesn't exist at all on the main list amongst economists 
uh, amongst bank uh, commissions, amongst the government. But they, they say, first of all, we need more regulation. Then, more radically, they say, let's break, break up the banks. The big banks have got to be broken up into smaller things so that they don't cause a, a systemic collapse if one of them goes down. And maybe we should start taxing them on a regular basis. If they're going to engage in risky activity, in derivatives, then we need a financial transaction tax on everything, all their transactions that go on in the financial sector. Now, all of these things sound like perhaps good ideas and may improve things. I'd just like to suggest to you that they're not enough, and in some cases they won't work. Um, take regulation. What does that mean? Well, um, under the previous rules set by the, in the European Commission, and the European Central Bank, you only had to have enough cash and stocks from your investors worth 2% of all the assets that you'd lent out when you bought. So if you bought, if you were a bank and you bought loads of bonds, or you lent to companies, uh, or you engaged in other activities, all you need to do to cover all those, that huge amount of activity you're going on was just 2% in cash and equity. So you can imagine, it didn't take much of a loss to make you bust. Obviously, People tended to, banks tended to have a bit higher amount than 2%. So what have they come up with? Well, they, in, down in Basel, where all these bankers congregate, the Bank of International Settlements, as they call it, they, they decided they're going to have a third measure of regulation out of this. They call it Basel III. And basically what they decided, instead of it just being 2%, from now on, they've got to keep 4.5% of all the assets they control in cash and equity. And, Possibly another two and a half, let's make it seven, just to be on the safe side. And if they start making money and they build up assets more, then they should probably put some even more in and get it up towards maybe nine, eight or nine percent of the total. So instead of having a leverage, as it's called, of two to what, say, a hundred, which is what it did before, 50 times, that was legal. Now they're going to have to have uh, probably the maximum leverage they're going to be able to have is something like 15 times, or maybe 20 times, still pretty high leverage, it wouldn't take much, like a, that would mean something like, uh, if you like, a 5 or a 6% fall in the uh, collapse in their assets, and they will be in trouble again and have to look for funds to re-establish. So uh, the idea is that uh, there'll be much tighter regulation in the particular, banks will, both will have to be very careful about what, they, uh, what their risk assets are. This is pretty complicated, but basically what it says is that um, You've got to have uh, you've got to have no more than 40% of all the assets can't be risky stuff. It's it's got to be 60%'s got to be safe stuff. That's the new position. And what's in the safe stuff is rather surprising. Yes, you can hold cash. That's all right. So if you've got cash, that's safe. Uh, you can hold the securities of governments. So if Slovenia issues a bond. You can buy that, and that's regarded as safe. Um, uh, <laughs> you can hold the central bank's reserves, uh, um, which in the case of Turkey or South Africa or Russia might be a bit of an issue for you. It might start disappearing. Um, you can also um, basically have a load of bonds which are owned by different governments, either your own government or maybe other people's governments or maybe the electricity utilities bond. That's safe stuff. That's okay. But you can still have 40%, which is in all kinds of everything else. Rotten corporate bonds, uh, all the stuff that was brought these banks to their knees before. So it's tight. They've shifted it around. Oh, and so when's this coming in? Well, you'll be, you'd think, well, after five years of discussing this, We'd be ready to put this into action, to really tighten up on what the banks are doing. Well, um, first of all, they don't, have to, they don't have to consider meeting the buffer, the, the ratio I was talking before about 5 or 7%, until the end of next year. So banks are now working towards that. This particular thing, moving towards that, doesn't have to come in till 2018, or in some cases, 2023. So uh, I don't know about you, but I'm working out just if I'm going to be around by then. But at this rate, this new measure to control and regulate the banks, A, is probably inadequate. Clearly it was last time, because there's always ways around it. And secondly, it's not coming in straight away. It's going to be very, very gradual. And who knows where we'll be when we get to 2023 before we can talk about it. Um, this is um, 
a comment of one of the bankers on this new regulation. This is quite a lot more favourable to the industry than we've been expecting. The changes to the definitions and the calculations look like a fairly massive softening of approach. So after much time, the banks have made sure that the impact of regulation will be blunted and it will take time before it's introduced. So my argument about that regulation is, well, nobody's opposed it, we probably need it on an international basis, some sort of minimum measure to stop banks just acting in a completely uh, risky and uncontrolled way. But regulation would not stop another of these crises because it was not adequate, it wasn't adequate last time, and even now it's not again adequate. Now, I want to bring in this because I've noticed in the IMF report on Slovenia uh, this January that they make the point that um, it wasn't really the banks that were the issue. In some ways, yes, the banks made huge lending, but it was the companies they lent to and what they did with that money that brought poor banks down to their knees in the end, in, or put them on, at least on shaky ground in the case of uh, uh, Slovenia and elsewhere brought them to the knees. So again, I want to emphasize that regulating the banks won't be enough <coughs> if the money you give it to turns out to be totally risky, whether it's corporations uh, investing in development projects and building things that don't eventually get filled, uh, whether it's uh, engaged in all kinds of, as it says here, risky projects without putting up their own money. And that's the risk that the regulation cannot be. Um, and the other question that was raised was um, breaking up the banks. Before I go back to this one, breaking up the banks. Now, this is a big position on the left. But uh, these banks are too big. One big bank like JP Morgan, like Lehman, so if it gets in trouble, everything everything goes down the toilet with it. So it pulls everything down the system. If we make the banks a lot smaller, then this problem will solve. Well, I, I've read all the commissions. There's a Volcker Commission in the US. There's two commissions in the UK. The Volcker Commission is, I think, 878 pages with appendixes. And in it, it concludes that maybe we should break the banks up. <laughs> and the reaction of the Senate and the Congress, particularly the Republicans, of course, is this won't work. This is far too complicated. And the, the other suggestion is, well, we don't actually, this is the UK suggestion, we don't actually break the banks up. What we do is one half of the bank lends money to households and to small businesses, because that's <coughs> safe. But the other half of the bank engages in all kinds of risky things. But we divide the two, and uh, there's only only the, the, the half that's risky will go down. If it go, if it fails, it just it will be bust, and we won't bail it out. The half that's safe, we, we will. Well, I have to say that most of the banks that got into trouble in the UK weren't actually risky ones. weren't engaged in that sort of risk. They were actually doing the normal things of lending to households and mortgages and and businesses. The Slovenian banks, as far as I can see, didn't do much derivative trading. They weren't engaged in all kinds of financial instruments of mass destruction. They were doing what is regarded as profit-making banking activities. So to make this division, whether it's to make banks smaller or to divide it between investment banks and uh, sort of bank classic banks, that again doesn't seem to be to solve the problem. Should we tax the banks? In other words, if they go if they, if they go bust, it doesn't matter, but at least we've got some money out of them when they weren't going bust. That seems to be the conclusion of financial transactions tax. I'm in favour of, of a financial transactions tax, and it probably could work uh, if a sufficient number of countries are prepared to implement it and apply it, say, in the Eurozone, and it will provide extra funding for the state. Uh, why not? Lots of other things are taxed, like tobacco and so on. Let's tax some, some of these uh, risky ventures there. But it's not a solution to avoiding another collapse in the banking system and bringing the world economy down with it. It's just a way of raising funds uh, in, in the course of allowing banks to do what they want. So none of those three things seem to me a particularly an answer to the question. And we have to remember that there's an idea in the minds of uh, the proponents of the current capitalist banking system that it actually is not only important, but actually the most important thing which sits upon the top of everything. Well, from a Marxist point of view, um, really banks are reallocating the resources created by the workforce, the labour, 
and the productive sectors of the economy, they're supposedly reallocating it so it becomes more efficient and more quick to reduce the costs of transactions. If I want, if you were uh, going to go out and, uh, I don't know, build a road for me, uh, I could, uh, you, if you might need some equipment and so on, I could uh, lend you the money direct. But what ten, uh, and then we, you go out and do it and then you bring me the money back. So I'm acting as a banker, but it's just a relationship between you and me. So that's, that's banking. But of course, on a modern economy, this doesn't operate like that. All the money goes into the banks either in deposits or whatever, and so on. And then the banks make decisions about what loans they're going to make and how it takes place. And in fact, in many cases, they make the loan first and then look to how to finance it afterwards. That's perhaps the modern system. So we've moved to a much more complex way of operating because it's supposedly more efficient. But it, banking itself does not create any new value. It's a very important point to, to remember that the banks are not doing a job of giving us extra resources and more output. All they're doing is redistributing the existing resources and output, supposedly in a more efficient way, to reduce costs. And that's the position of, the, of Andy Haldane and the Bank of England, uh, particularly when it comes to what investment banks do, which is basically bet. They're betting on the price of something going up and down. They're not doing banking. They're not lending to people to go and build roads or to, to have a house. They're betting on whether the price of a stock will go up, whether the price of a bond will go up, whether the price of the derivative of that bond will go up, whether the price of the option of the derivative of that bond will go up. They're betting on all kinds of things. It's horse, bet it's, uh, horse race betting. Every night, late into the night, when I'm on the, on the TV, uh, I'm watching something pretty bad at the end. I know all the adverts switch over to betting. And we're, I don't know what happens in Slovenia, but it certainly does in England. Now we have betting ads all the time, online betting. So basically, you're sitting by your computer and you're being advertised to go on there and bet. You know, whether it's bingo, whether it's poker, whether it's betting on the horses, whether it's or betting on something or other. I'm not quite sure what they are online betting is on. But that is actually what investment banking is engaged in. It's just a, a risk venture of betting all the time. And yet, this doesn't add anything to value. As Andy Haldane said, we allocate risk in the system, but it doesn't change anything much. And uh, we don't count these things, we shouldn't count these things as part of the value of the economy. And in fact, they're, they're probably damaging the economy. So we have a banking system which doesn't add value, which is engaged in all kinds of risk-taking activities, which doesn't do the basic job of providing a service in lending to the businesses, small particularly, and to households, but it's mostly engaged in trying to make huge amounts of profit out of risk-taking and betting on all kinds of weird financial instruments, and in the course of doing so, rigging markets, and eventually bringing the whole economy down in the great big meltdown that we had in 2008-9. What's the answer to that? We're told regu more regulation, breaking up the banks to some extent, or dividing off their risk-taking activities, and taxing them. Um, I haven't noticed there was talk about the EC Commission was even going to stop perhaps their bonuses getting too high. Because these masters of the universe continue with their bonuses. And I don't know you too well, working with some of the masters of the universe, that their bonuses are fine. I can tell you that now. But they're not too worried. And in fact, we now know that they've got round even the regulations that the EU Commission has come up with by finding ways of paying people more and deferring all their stock options to the future so that once they make a profit in three years' time, they're a huge amount of money back. So no change whatsoever in the country of the banks, in the operation of the banks, and above all, in my, in my opinion, what required, needs to be done in the ownership of the banks. The big multinational banks around the world in the big economies are mostly privately owned. Even in Slovenia, which has a... a two or three, two and a half state banks, if you like, with 42% of bank assets state owned, which is much higher than most places. Even here, 33% of the investment, that is the equity, into those banks is foreign. Foreign banks have a big influence over the Slovenian banking system, even if they own the smaller banks. And so there is no way that there's really much difference in the way in which it's been operating despite the crisis and nothing has changed. We need to present the case to people that if we want a banking system that operates as a public service, it's got to be publicly owned. That's the first thing. It's an obvious thing that it's just like health, it's just like education. It's so important to the economy, it should be publicly owned so the, the assets and the equity in that bank 
and the banking system is in that position where it can be controlled and any gains made for it and any decisions made on loans and investment uh, will be made as a part of the public interest. And of course, it's not just a question of being publicly owned. We have now two publicly owned, partially publicly owned banks in the UK, two biggest ones. They're slowly being privatised, and that's exactly what's happened. Wherever a bank has been nationalised in order to save it, uh, it's been kept at arm's length, the executives are unchanged, the management's unchanged, the culture's unchanged, uh, all that the government does is say, well, when you've finally got things turned around by sacking enough bank workers and uh, reducing, selling off a load of assets you don't need, then, you can, then we'll sell our share back into the private sector and you can carry on just as before. Because we don't want to own the banks, we don't want to control the banks. It's completely separate from what governments should do. Well, I disagree. That's exactly what governments should be doing. And we need to have control of those banks democratically run and controlled. And the bank workers should have a say. Why don't uh, uh, state banks, the board uh, directors, why, who appoints them? Where are they from? Why are they so independent? I was thinking about it today on the, on the plane over. Wait a moment. Why have we got national central banks, which are now the, the, the fashionable thing in the last 20 years of neoliberalism, is that they should be independent from the government, independent from the public. Central banks should be independent. So the man who's in charge happens to be some master of the universe who's been switched over to become head of the central bank. He's totally independent. He sets the interest rates as he and his board think. It's nothing to do with the government. They have no say because we want the financial sector to completely be out of control of government and the public accountability. Central banks in most national countries are unaccountable, except maybe the one-year statements of the government. They decide interest rates. They decide all the, uh, all the facilities that they provide, this board composed of other bankers. And the European Central Bank is really in the same position. It defends its independence. Mario Draghi spends a lot of time saying, I'm independent from the German government. They don't tell me what to do. The Italian government doesn't tell me what to do. Well, maybe they should. Why, why should uh, Draghi and his board decide what the interest rate should be and what pro program should be adopted by the European Central Bank. Because unless it's democratically controlled, where the people have a say, we can't develop a national plan for growth and investment. And that's what we need to do if banks are going to become a public skirt. Now, I'm bringing up a man who's been, not been around for very long, uh, for nearly 100 years now, but he made a very simple point about uh, ownership of the banks back during probably some, almost exactly a, a hundred years ago, that the advantage is from the whole of, to the people, the nationalisation of the banks is normal. Availability of credit on easy terms for small owners, for peasants, not for those left now, um, would, increase, uh, would be, increase immensely. As to the state, they'd be in a position to review all the monetary operations, which will be unconceivable, to control them, to regulate economic life, and to obtain Billions for major state transactions without paying these gentlemen in the banks sky-high commissions for their services. Uh, a publicly owned bank would have not huge salaries for its uh, representatives on the board. And in my view, those, those board members will not only be accountable, but also elected, as I'll come into. But once we begin to apply a state banking system as a public service, then we can begin to return the fruits of that around to make banking a contributor to reducing the cost of transaction of, of, of credit and loans, and in that sense, perhaps providing a service, if not value, uh, to a better economy. Now, out in North Dakota, which is a Republican right-wing province, the state of the US, there is a state bank which we, uh, uh, Marxists, quite like, because in there, it says that uh, out of there, that the State Bank of North Dakota, which is the only one, publicly owned, it gets all the funds from the North Dakota state uh, government coffers, go into its uh, coffers as deposits. It takes the deposits of customers and small farmers and the rest of it. And as the, the head of the North Dakota State Bank says, uh, our funding model is quite unique. Um, we take all the state tax collections, we have a deposit base. So, the other private banks, if they're competing, they don't get the state money. It all goes into our coffers. We have, uh, we pay the state a reasonable rate for those monies. And then what do we do with that? So we get all that money, uh, we plough that back into the state of North Dakota in the form of loads. 
We invest in our state in the economic development type of activities. We grow our state through that mechanism. We have these programs for this, whether it's agriculture, economic development programs, energy programs, and education. We do a lot of student financing at reasonable rates. So it's government money, it's depositor money. That's what they do. They don't do derivatives, they don't do anything else. That's all they do. And we've done it for 90 years. This bank, when it's profitable, pays a dividend back to the government, the state government. They get a dividend as a result of any profit. And that's, that's the process. And there's no big bonuses. And, they don't, and, and they've been, had no problem during this crisis. Um, this bank is the sort of model that we're looking to develop for a public service of banking. The Alinka, as we will hear over the next couple of days, have also, the, the experts there, who we should be hearing from, um, have also presented proposals which in many ways make similar, put forward the similar idea that I presented in this lecture, that we need to develop where the ownership is not just the question alone, because we know in the case of Slovenia there's plenty of state ownership of banks, but also it's control and democratic bodies being involved, legitimated through direct election of these boards, and that we, we have control of what they do in terms of whether they engage in these financial risk activities that can be evaluated, and that their bonuses and remuneration systems are under the control of the people, and the bank workers involved. And that position that Delenka has got in many ways is similar to what I'm proposing here. We just like to make two more points, and this is very, very important, because we get obsessed with the banks, we forget that the banks are really just part of a capitalist economy, producing for profit, and the vast majority of the economy will either grow healthily or fall away, depending on whether capitalism is healthily producing enough profit or is in trouble because it's not profitable enough. And when we look at the case of what the IMF delegate said when he recently came over to Slovenia to tell them how to prioritise, um, he made the point that even though the manifestation of fiscal problems, which has left the Slovenian government with this rising public debt of 70% of GDP and deficits, and we know three or four years of recession, maybe more, the fiscal problems was in the banking system, but the deep roots were in the corporate sector. It wasn't just banking, it was the whole capitalist sector, particularly the corporate sector, the developers, the construction companies, in connivance with, as we know, various deals with members of the government and so on, and the bankers and the leaders. But the whole system was one, and that the banks are only part, the banking system has to be sorted because they reflect, as it were, the symptoms of what was going on in the, in the Slovenian economy in general. And that's why you need not just a democratically owned, run banking systems of public service, but as a public service, it must be part of a national plan for a healthier economy, for a growing economy, an investment economy. This is complicated, but all I'm really saying is that, in many ways, public ownership can't stop at the banks, it's got to go on to the major sectors of the economy, so that we can integrate a national plan for investment, the green at the top, and the fly. Uh, and then we have submissions in the different parts of, the, of a local organisation, to bring out a plan which produces an agreed financial target. So the state banks know that what they're operating on is a target set by a plan drawn up by the various bodies of a nation or a, a country through its different submissions. And out of that, the publicly owned banks, mainly cooperative banks too, there's no reason why they couldn't be set up, and other trade, trade unions at a very local level could all be part of this with a target for the national plan. And the, the, the publicly owned banks would be democratically controlled, either by elected representatives, by elected representatives of bank workers, by the government itself, and by the organisations that use the banks, directly elected. I could see, for example, if you have parliamentary elections, I think, next year, uh, why are we just electing the government? Why not elect all the state banks' boards at the same time, let people stand? Let them, uh, let them present the reason why they're going to be on those boards for. Uh, I think the uh, governor of the Central Bank of Slovenia and his board should be directly elected. And they should be subject to a program set by the government as financial targets. Let's bring the banking system back under the control of the people, publicly only, democratically controlled, accountable, and re removable by the people if they don't do the job they should be doing. Thank you.
thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, the head of the U.S. Volcker Commission, that would not happen to be Paul Volcker, the infamous mastermind of the Volcker shock? You have got him, yeah. He's ah. still going. <laughs> okay, just wondering. Okay, so, uh, any questions? I think uh, uh, the lecture was uh, kept at a reasonably short uh, length, so that we can uh, extend the discussion a bit. Um, uh, if not, uh, I have one actually. Uh, I think I think it is much easier to uh, prove to people uh, in, uh, say, Ljubljana or Athens uh, that there is a certain flaw in this big engine of economy as we have it, uh, 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 compared to, say, Berlin or Brussels or Washington or London and so on. But there is another dilemma, and that is the dilemma of feasibility. Uh, everybody is very doubtful of that. Uh, the question is a very practical one. How much uh, would such reforms uh, being begun in a single country within the framework of the European Union uh, uh, have a, uh, what kind of obstacles would they face? What kind of repercussions, warnings from the European Commission and so forth? Well, um, very well, huge obstacles. Um, this is against everything that the European Commission stands for, everything that the European project so far has been organised. I mean, the European Commission, the Treaty of Rome is for free markets. Although, and the structure of the European Central Bank is deliberately independent, at least officially, from the governments, although, of course, they all, each national central bank governor is on there, so the influence of governments is indirect, uh, but it's totally undemocratic. Uh, we don't have any elections of these people. We don't have uh, Euro elections for the European Central Bank. We have no way in which we can change the policy of the European Central Bank and, and so on. And for any, say for example, let's put it this way, say a party should come to office with a majority in Slovenia in the parliamentary elections with this program and say, well, uh, we're going to change things. We don't want the Slovenian Central Bank to be independent. Uh, we don't, we're going to take over the bigger banks and integrate them into one state publicly owned, democratically run banking system. We're not going to carry through the bad bank plan of the government. We're going to go for a different strategy which integrates that. And we're going to have to look at some of the big uh, uh, companies in Slovenia and utilities and so on and integrate them into a national plan. Now, um, that will produce, I could imagine, something like an explosion from the European Union leaders and so on, in, in total opposition, that uh, Slovenia was breaking its rules, the IMF would say, no, thank you very much, you'd have, the, you'd have a complete opposition. You would have a battle between, uh, I mean, we, to some extent, this is a situation that Syriza may face in 12 months' time if they come to power. If they, if they want to operate on a more radical policy which rejects the program uh, of austerity and the IMF program, and tries to renegotiate it with the EU and so on. All those issues are going to open up a major political campaign from one side and from the other side. And so, what is it feasible? I don't know. You've got to win. <laughs> uh, it's a political issue then. The question we're discussing perhaps at the moment is not the political issue, but is it, is it correct? Is it realistic? Is it the right thing in order to organize an economy and the banking system as part of that? This way, I mean, my argument is it is because we can see all the other ways so far have not only failed, but they've actually driven the economy down a hole and driven our living standards with it. Um, okay. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Mr. Roberts, I have a question or a comment, rather. Well, first of all, I like what you, hear, what you said to us, and uh, I think you know that you come from a part of the world where everything had been private for a number of years. Now, we here in Slovenia come from the other end of the world where we've had everything nationalized, and now we'd like to go public, uh, sorry, private. Mm -hmm. Now, as much as it sounds appealing to us, you know, that uh, we would like to go private, you come from the other side, towards, the, towards our end. Mm -hmm. Now, if I look at some publicly owned companies, type Apple or Google, I would say, well, aren't they publicly owned? 
And even though they seem to be publicly owned, in fact, they are very much independent. Now, if you recall, Steve Jobs was so much of an independent guy, he was fighting his owners, public, in order to go his way towards strategy, product development, or even sharing the profits of the company, which he didn't share back to the public. So I would say, you know, that uh, going public or being private in terms of what Apple or, or Google have to offer is a little bit astray from what you offer here to us. So that's one position. On the other hand, coming from our end, what we see now, or what we see in Slovenia, is that everything that had been run publicly had been actually very inefficient. Mm -hmm. Inefficient to the extent that it's a breeding ground for all sorts of briberies, all sorts of corruption that has gone uh, up, up to our noses, you know, to the extent that we, we loathe everything that is, that is national, or let's say public, which is synonymous with being just inefficient, plain and blunt inefficient. And we, we, we think, you know, that if Ljubljansk Bank is being privatized, that it should be, or it should have been, run more efficiently. Now, you say that your banks, the Bank of Scotland, or any, or any other large bank that you're, that you're proud of, that they would be run better off if they were public, well, I think that you know that you have you know here a, a perfect example of what is not being efficient because it had been uh, public. It's a very good question. I mean, you want me to answer one by one, or do you want to take it through? Well, any other questions at the moment? Uh, if not, shoot. Sure. Okay. Well, let, let's get. I mean, Apple is a private company that uh, makes things to make a profit. That's its aim. Saying it's not a provider of public service. Yes, the public own it, at least a small proportion of the American public own the shares in it, and there are millions of shareholders, as there are in both countries, uh, where companies have millions of shareholders, but of course the company is actually owned by maybe five or six big shareholders. They control the board, they have the majority. That's how a joint stock companies used to be called works, so that we can all have a share um, in the Apple if we want to. Uh, but it won't make any difference to what Apple does and what, what it makes, uh, what, it, what profit it wants to get, and how it operates. Steve Jobs may find that he disagrees with his board because he wants to do something, and his board, who he's brought in all these other people, the banks, and private equity people, and everybody else onto Apple to expand it. We're seeing the same thing with Facebook, which has now gone public. Uh, in other words, you can own a share in Facebook, and whatever his name is, Look at Hamar, I forget his name. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, now it doesn't own the company 50%, but he still owns the biggest proportion of it, and his mates own that, and they still control the board. Maybe they would fall out of the board, and maybe they lose control. That, I'm not, what, what I can tell you is that you, me, and I, if we bought 10 shares in Facebook or Apple Book, will have no control over whatever that company does. So that we don't have to consider that question as such. Now, so to be clear, that's not what I call public ownership. What I'm talking about is something that is controlled by the people through its elected representatives, through its government organizations and so on, and it is aimed at providing a service for the public. And now, what does existing publicly owned corporations in countries like Slovenia, from its past as an ex- communist state, if you want to call it that, where everything was publicly owned, under the tradition, presumably, of my Lenin quote, although Lenin would probably have had a fit if he'd seen how they'd been run, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it comes from that direction, and quite understandably, given the complete disaster that many of that this organised, this planning, and these publicly company, op operated companies delivered to the population, not entirely, because, I mean, we won't go into the history of whether these companies are all failures, whether a publicly owned system in Russia is a complete failure compared to what it's got now, we can argue the toss about whether you know, millions of Russians agree with you that um, it's much better to have 30 oligarchs running Russia than it was the previous system, because that's basically what we're being offered. You say, people want to go for privatization, well, I'll tell you what they're going to end up with. 
And I suspect they probably partly ended up with it in Slovenia already. That you've basically got a few oligarchs and rich billionaires in hand and glove with the government and maybe heads of co public corporations carving up the country for their benefit. Where previously what you had was a load of bureaucrats with uh, maybe with a military behind them carving up the country for their own benefit and calling it publicly owned. We, we have to break through these two models. I don't think the alternative to the model of, of, a, of a bureaucratically run planned economy with, where the people's rights and services were ignored, the alternative is to move to where oligarchs decide uh, under a privately owned companies how to operate uh, the economy and control it. But that, we're trying to cut through this. I think this is the purpose of, it's a very good question because we have to discuss how we can cut through those two models and come up with a model which is in the interest of the people, which represents what the people need, and also provides the opportunity to control it. It's not a question of delivering it to the people, it's giving the people the power to control and do that. And I think there is a third, there is a way to cut through the middle between privatisation, a profit-seeking corporation, and <coughs> operating all corporations like that, and masters of the universe like banks, and going back to a system where it's bureaucratically operated, where utilities and other companies, even not even utilities, but big state-owned companies have appeared to have no interest in providing what people need, but simply to either to line their pockets for their friends or just provide a service without any democratic control and plan. And we have to break through that. This is what I think <coughs> this next few days and probably what you had last week is part of the program to come up with something you can put to people which will deliver that. I've attempted in a brief lecture to suggest the way forward. Maybe it's not perfect. We have to discuss it. Okay, my next question. I'm just going to make a short oh. comment on that. I don't want to speak for too, too long, but um, the hear? idea that the, that the former Soviet Union and the countries of Eastern Europe were inherently inefficient has been denied. Sorry, could you just take the microphone? Can you hear at the back? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The idea that uh, the countries in Eastern Europe uh, failed and that uh, that model of socialism failed uh, was very dominant for the last 20 years. But we have two counter arguments. The first is that capitalism has manifestly also failed. In Britain, our living standards are still lower on average than they were in 2008, and that will continue to be the case for some years to come. But now let's look at uh, an efficient country with efficient factories, that's China. China has been growing at seven, eight percent a year uh, for decades. It's pulled hundreds of thousands of people out of poverty. Now, I understand that Chinese banks are not as cuddly as the Bank of North Dakota. <laughs> uh, but I think that they have been extremely effective because what happens in China is not that you get uh, Mr. Stalin uh, allocating resources from the centre, but resources <coughs> are actually allocated for uh, planned growth by the banking system itself. And actually, uh, not democratic at all, but quite very much in the manner that uh, Michael Roberts suggested, we would get big gains from uh, having, the, having the banking system actually involved in developing production rather than in speculation. I need to add a comment here. Now, Mr. Roberts, you come from the country that actually gave us or inherited the democratic system. Well, that democratic system evolved into a capitalistic system which is now, well, growing faster than most of Europe at this very moment that we speak. On the other hand, uh, the greater part of the audience in here today was born in, I suggest, in Yugoslavia. Now, when I came across the book called The Animal Farm of George Orwell, your compatriot, I said, bloody hell, what he's writing is about the Yugoslav revolution or any kind of socialist revolution. Some animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Now, this is a plague of all socialistic systems. 
Now, you, 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 you put in an assumption that the capitalist system is inefficient. Well, I well, will tell you now that socialism failed because it has proven not to be inefficient because it was just so corrupt where everybody was not as equal as everybody else. And we've just heard here that, that China is like taking the middle ground, proclaiming the state capitalism. Why? Because there is, like you know, like in the times of old of old Greece, where the oracles on the Olympus, they were actually, you know, the, the, the wise men decided what to do. And this is what China has. Well, it appears that in Slovenia we do not have enough wise men sitting on the top of the Olympus or Trigla, because they all want to, to, to go after their own interests and not for the public interests. And whereas in you in Britain, you got like, you know, a very loud upper and lower uh, home in, in, in the parliament where they seem to be fighting each other pretty well. They seem to be, from our neck of woods, far more efficient than our end. Uh, well, okay, uh, I need to respond to that. I, I think let the, let the audience want to respond to that one. I can come back at the end if there's any more. Uh, Otherwise... Okay, there's a response back there. Now, uh, I suppose as a uh, uh, audience that is a sort of a democratic collective as well, we can decide whether to uh, focus <laughs> on uh, bank socialization or have uh, broader debates, but uh, are we there at the moment? Uh, yeah, thank you for your nice lecture. I would like to move away from this not really productive debate and ask you something different. Um, uh, in your lecture you were uh, in a very quick manner criticizing the the distinction or the, uh, the the border between investment and commercial banking, let's say some kind of a glass seagull act for for yeah. for, the, for the new millennium or, or something like that. And uh, I was wondering, what is your critique? What is your position on on um, on something like this being put into action today? Do you think that uh, in a way this could be a, pr a progressive measure for for the uh, especially for the, as you said, uh, derivatives as a, a weapons of mass destruction uh, for their um, for their uh, control, or uh, and do you think that this would um, uh, this would um, improve the classical banking? So gathering the savings and putting them into investment, and do, uh, do you think that this would be at least some kind of a moral pressure? that the left could, uh, in a way, through this, uh, let's say, new Glass-Siegel Act put into the bankers and their, uh, and their practice? Well, I, I think it's a principle a bank should be engaged in using the deposits and borrowings that they've raised to invest in the economy, the economy, by the loaning to households and lowing commercial to companies so that they can employ people and the economy can progress, as opposed to betting on prices. This division between the two and the principle is what we need to sort out. And that the banks that are operating in the interests of the people should be engaged in that first objective and not really in the second objective at all. Now, the question is what is the best way to achieve the end of banks becoming just betting machines or glorified hedge funds to put it bluntly what a hedge fund does is it raises money from investors and then bets on the stock market or bets on the bonds or, and it buys and sells and goes short it bets on the price going down or bets on the price going up or it bets on Apple as opposed to Facebook that's what a hedge fund does it just raises money from people usually very rich people and says I can get you 20% on your money, while well, if you leave it at the bank, you'll get two. Give it to me, and I'll bet on the market. And of course, most of them fail, but you don't hear about that. And rich people lose their money, but some people make a huge amount of money, uh, whether they're George Soros or something, they have billions, and so on. But we don't want banks, we don't want banks that are operating for a service of the people to be engaged in that as their major activity. So the principle of dividing that off, this sort of risky activity, which is what most banks have been doing, to make money because they don't make much money the other way. That's how they've been doing it. That principle we've got to break off. And what's the best way to do that? I was arguing in the lecture 
that the best way isn't just to have some sort of rule or law or some sort of firewall or even a separation of the banks. As I said, that if you're engaged in hedge fund type activities, then we won't bail you out. If you're engaged in classical bank activities, then we will bail you out. Unfortunately, quite a few of the banks, as I said, that went down weren't engaged in hedge fund activities. They do the ordinary stuff. They got hit anyway because the economy went down and they weren't able to survive. So it's, it's not as simple as just dividing it in two or having a firewall. What we need is a whole different way of organizing the banks and making sure that they're controlled and operating in that way. And just doing that, the Glass-Siegel Act, and making that division between hedge fund activities and proper banking activities it wouldn't be enough. Are we still going to pay huge bonuses to these bankers? Are they going to be completely out of our control? Uh, and what sort of regulations are we imposing? There's a whole series of other things which would be required on top. The simplest way, it's a simple proposition, is that if we have a democratically controlled, organized banking system under the control of the people, where it's not operating to make a huge profit by risk-making activities, that's a simple way of doing it, rather than coming up with complicated things. As I say, the Volcker Commission and the re reintroduction of the Glass-Siegel Act, for those people who don't know what that was, that used to be an act in America which made these divisions between banks, was abolished under the Democrats and Clinton, uh, and deregulated the banks so banks could do what they like, uh, so that uh, they could operate and risk-taking activities and not worry about anything else. Um, that they want to reintroduce what they used to have, divide the two banks. Didn't stop banking crisis, by the way. There was loads of it in America, even with the Glass-Siegel. But the Glass-Siegel Act and the new version is incredibly complicated to, to sort this out. Is this, for example, the sort of discussion that goes on or will go on in the Commission is, well, is, the, is it betting on a mortgage-backed asset risky, or is that okay? Is that, is that okay or not okay? Or with this, but I've just invented a new instrument which didn't exist before, and it's absolutely safe. I'm a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and I can tell you that it's safe. So it should be in the safe camp, and the banks should be able to do that. That's what's going to happen if we go down this process, because the, what's driving these banks is not a is to make as much profit as possible for the shareholders, and as much bonus and income for the executives and managers who run these banks. That's what their objective is. It's not objective to provide a service to the people. And that is what we have to establish in the banking system. It won't just be done by trying to find some way to make a division between the uh, investment role of the bank and the hedge fund role of the bank. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Mr. In the sense that uh, if you have 100,000 farmers who need to buy tractors, they can just go to their ordinary savings bank in their North Dakota state and, and uh, get the money they need. But if they have, if you don't have 100,000 farmers, you have only 100 farmers or monopolists, they of course need a lot of money. And there will be interest, of course, then to have good connections with the big banks or to have money for the big investments. And then, of course, connections which firms will sell the seats and so on. So what we can, what we can work here is to have, the, to have also the smaller enterprises, to have the small farmers. And that's the way they will demand to have the smaller banks. Look from, let's say, from a, market, from a market point of view, if you have a demand for the banks, for smaller banks, there will be, there will be those banks. Uh, okay, any comments? Uh, I actually have one more question. Yeah. Uh, could you care to comment on an example that uh, I don't really uh, know that thoroughly, and I don't think anybody else as well. But in Britain, there was a, a rather substantially large uh, cooperative bank, <laughs> and it went into uh, rather classical financial difficulties. Do you care to explain the example? It's a terrible story. The cooperative movement is in the UK, back in the 19th century, was a great movement. 
from the working class and, and uh, benefactors of the working class who look to develop things like credit unions, cooperative activities based in the local area, not just uh, but for industry setting up, so factories would be cooperatively owned by the people who worked in them. Uh, there's a whole range of other activities. This is a movement in Britain, an alternative to a capitalist joint stock company that we've been talking about. This movement was big. It had a lot of support in local areas, and it developed into the 20th century into a sizable business enterprise. It obviously became profit making, but the profit, make, profit was to go back to the people who worked in it. There was no shareholders, it was a cooperative loaned operator. And it was in all kinds of things, whether it was in making fair industrial parts, it was in uh, funeral direction, the cooperative movement was big in putting you in, in, a, in a hole when you die. It, it was engaged in banking as well, and it also had a retail shopping operation, still does, had a whole range of other things. Furniture making, I can't remember, Mick will know better than me, the, the range of, uh, uh, this was a major, it was a movement. But of course, as we go into the 20th century, the 21st century, this thing gets converted basically into a capitalist enterprise. The control of, the, of these cooperatives is no longer under the people working in them, or even cooperative members. I used to be a co-op member here. And when you went into the co-op, it was a shop, you would get a co-op stamp back, and at the end of the year, you get a bit of dividend because you were a shareholder, you were part of the co-op. That was the operation, even if you bought just you know, a bottle of milk from it or something, you were part of it. Uh, that turned, into, turned gradually into a capitalist enterprise, <coughs> where, particularly the banking sector, where the managers of the bank were paid just like all the other banks, the chairman of the bank was they're operating in entirely the same way. And this co-op bank got rather excited in the last 10 or 15 years and felt that it could become a big mover, particularly after the collapse of other banks. And it started to try and buy up whole sections of the banking uh, sector that were going down at a cheap price so that it would become a, a force in the, in the marketplace. It well overstretched itself. And what it did was, it started to buy other banks that were basically mortgage lenders, which are basically bust. It bought banks which had no assets at all, really, and was left with their debts. How could that happen? Well, we now know that the chairman of the bank, who had no banking qualifications, was a recruiter, now turns out to have been a, what did they make? He's a crystal, crystal he's a drug addict, um, he was, this is the chairman of the bank, and Mr. Flowers, a drug addict. He was also engaged in all kinds of other nefarious activities of a rather inappropriate nature to do with matters that we perhaps, you know, don't want to discuss uh, in open. This guy was the chairman of the bank, and and uh, the, the rest of the executive were also on these fat salaries, trying to buy up dead companies and turning a cooperative movement into a basically a distressed bank hedge fund. Now, this was the culture which had developed within the, the co-op bank in particular, the co-op group. Now, eventually this came crashing down, and they are billions of pounds in debt. Uh, they, what was their solution? A few months ago, their solution was to appoint a new chief executive. We now hear only this week, he's resigned after a month or two, because he says it's impossible to deal with. Hmm. I can't, this, this, this thing, is a, it's got all kinds of things going on. It's not a proper bank. It's got funeral directors, it's got this, it's got, I can't handle all this. I mean, what is this thing? It, it, now that the culture of the cooperative movement is completely, he cannot understand it. It turns out he was on three million pounds uh, a, a year, plus bonus to sort this out, and uh, all the other board members are also taking similar sorts of huge amounts of money. This is a cooperative movement, which part of the labour movement, has been turned into a nasty, broken hedge fund. It's a disaster. It's an example, another victim of the culture of banking that we've seen over the past period and is now exhibited in the last five years. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yeah. 
the microphone is somewhere way in the back. If it would uh, come forward, eventually we would appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I was uh, wondering what uh, setting up a system like you described uh, implies. Um, I guess uh, you cannot institute it without fire engine reforms also of government because as you mentioned the ECB um, I was thinking well thank God that they're independent from the European Commission <laughs> the people at the ECB are at least sane uh, and they try to bend the rules a bit uh, the European Commission is far worse in my uh, opinion um, and also what would be the relationship of this system to uh, the private system if it coexisted because I imagine if you had an related private system besides this kind of system, the situation that was going on before the crisis, it would mean that this private system would still get uh, be able to mobilize um, insane amounts of money and uh, still cause enough damage to bring the whole economy down and bring this uh, socialized system down. So I guess you would also need fire engine regulation of the private uh, banking system outside of the social. Well, yes, um, obviously. Well, I would see the socialized system as being so large in terms of its assets and fun funding, like in North Dakota, that it wouldn't be in a position where, the, if there are private banks, and it looks so like objective and being set up, that they'd be highly regulated and they wouldn't be, able, they wouldn't be engaged in hedge fund activity. Um, that uh, they would not be in a position where they would actually distort the process of the circulation of capital uh, among the targets that are set by the government. On, on the question of, I mean, there are a number of complex issues, and maybe we're going to discuss them over the next few days, but talking about a national banking system, we are, we're in an international world, and as you say, we're in the Europe, um, where, and uh, there we have a banking system which is predominantly privately owned and controlled in, uh, not controlled by the people. We have institutions of the, of the European Union, which I said earlier, like the European Commission, which is dedicated to free markets, to privatisation, to uh, not allowing um, a people's type of banking system. We have a European Banking Union about to be set up, which will be basically just regulating all the big multinational banks in Europe through a series of regulations which the European Central Bank will organise. Uh, whether you consider the European Central Bank a more successful and a people-friendly organisation than the European Commission is perhaps a matter for the debate that we could take place. It seems to me the purpose of the European Central Bank is to set an interest rate which is acceptable to the capitalist system and to provide funding for, for banks uh, if they get into difficulty. Uh, but it still doesn't provide a role for meeting people's needs. It's, it's designed to, to, to make the banking system work as it is now. Uh, now, whether you think Mario Draghi is doing a better job of that than the European Commission would do, we could discuss. I mean, clearly the European Commission is committed uh, to a program of free markets and privatisation. As far as I know, Mario Draghi's views are pretty much the same. Uh, have, uh, I believe he's a Catholic, so he might be a bit better, I don't know. Uh, uh, but uh, it seems to me that there isn't a difference there that we should be concerned about. Um, the issue you raise is, is a difficult one, though. It's one thing to have a national plan. We're still going to have the private sector in every country. We're certainly going to have it in Europe. and it's, So it's an issue that is going to be a political one. It's a process of a campaign in other countries to see whether they want to go the same way if, you, if your country wants to go a certain way. It, it, nothing is solved by just looking at an election and saying, well, that looks okay, <laughs> maybe, although obviously not everybody agrees, uh, but how do you implement it? Well, that's a big different uh, issue again. 